Good morning, Anthem Church. Welcome to our Thanksgiving morning service. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Let's all stand to our feet, worship our God, just lift up our voices and tell him what we're thankful for. Father God, we thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus, God, for the sacrifice on the cross, Lord, for bringing us together, making us all brothers and sisters, Lord. We love you and we honor you, God. I pray that just today in this season, God, so that we lift up our eyes to you because we know that's where our help comes from, God. We know that all the things that we have, all the good things we have, God, they're from you. And so we give you the glory. We give you the honor. And we pray that you just bless us and you tune our hearts to hear you, God, to see you, God, to understand that all the things that we have from you are from you, Lord. We love you. We honor you, God. In Jesus' name, we want to worship you today, God. Thank you. Yes. 
into the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. God, we thank you. Come on, church, let's pray with me. God, we thank you that we can enter into your house with praise and thanksgiving. And your word says, God, that you are your, your praise, God, that inhabit in the praises of your people. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that your promises are true, God. Thank you that you're faithful. You're faithful for the ages, God. You're faithful. No matter what, what's going on in our lives, God, you are always will remain faithful, God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness, your grace, God. Thank you, God, that we can press in. We can press in and everything that we came here with, any kind of burden, God, we can lay it at your feet. In Jesus' name, God, thank you. Thank you that we can have a season of gratefulness, that the entire nation thanks you, God. I believe it's being thankful and grateful for you, God. We honor you. We glorify you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. You're always faithful, always faithful to the ages. There's no one like you, Jesus. No one like you, Jesus.
Lord Jesus, we cry out from our heart, Lord. We cry out from our soul. We cry out from our spirit, Lord, in gratitude, thanking you, Lord, for all you have been doing in our lives, Lord, what you are currently doing, Lord. We are praising you in advance, Lord, for what you will do in our lives, Lord God. We cry from our spirit, Lord, thanking you, saying, God, there is no place we would rather be, Lord. The only place we want to be is in your presence, Lord, with our family, Lord, in the house of the Lord where we are planted, Father. We thank you for the work that you have prepared for us to do in advance, Lord. Let us be your hands. Let us be your feet, Lord. Let us be generous. Let us be loving. Let us do your will, Lord. Let us further your kingdom and not our kingdom, God. Maranatha, Jesus, come quickly, but use us while we still have time on this earth. Praise to you, Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Woo. Welcome to Anthem Church. Anthem Church. Uh, Sunday is obviously like our celebration. We uh, have a great time coming together, uh, worshiping with one another. The scriptures say that uh, Jesus went specifically intentionally out of his way to draw men to him, right? He would uh, go through Samaria. He would find Zacchaeus. He says, I, I have to go to your house. And uh, he comes to worship in spirit and in truth. And uh, that is something we will be doing uh, in this church, Lord, today. We will be worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth uh, as our local body here connected with our Father. Uh, we do have some amazing announcements. Uh, but before we do, I want to thank each and every one of you to uh, co for coming today and worshiping with one another. So feel free to turn to your neighbors and thank them for uh, being here, for uh, pouring into your life because we need one another to grow. Uh, anyone watching online, we want to thank you for participating in uh, this worship with us as we worship our Father, Lord, in spirit and in truth. God, you have been faithful and we are just super excited um, <laughs> for everything you're doing in our church today, God. Thank you for your goodness in this season of holidays, Lord. We celebrate you in this season of celebrations, uh, the season of Thanksgiving. We give thanks for all that you are currently doing in our lives. And uh, as far as announcements, we want to not just be thankful for what he's doing here, but we also want to thank God out of gratitude of our heart. And, uh, and let that blessing uh, not withhold that blessing that God has given us, right? But also give it to others. Uh, so we will, we are currently at church doing a food drive for Thanksgiving to help other people, right? Uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to help uh, other people during these holidays who don't have much food to eat. So for that, we will have a bin outside where you can, uh, on uh, to donate frozen turkeys, um, canned goods, all food that does not perish, like God's word. Uh, so bring that type of food, right? Nothing that perishes. We're not about that. Um, bring that. And then, yeah, we're going to bless people with that. Uh, on the 27th, our YA is having a Friendsgiving celebration, right? So we're going to gather together on the 27th and uh, we're going to first celebrate for what God has done. And then in tables, we will uh, have a feast. We will break bread, um, break chicken legs, whatnot, um, and turkey legs, right? And uh, we do, it's a $10 uh, ticket. Uh, feel free to contact me about that. Um, also, if it is your first time coming to YA, it is free. So if you have friends that have never been to Anthem uh, and or they don't have somewhere to celebrate Thanksgiving with, we want them to celebrate with us, right? So invite your friends, say, hey, do you have a Friendsgiving? I have a lot of friends at Anthem that would love for you to come and join us, right? So please come through for that. It's going to be really awesome, really excited for it. Um, and then the last way we're going to be worshiping God is we're going to be worshiping him through uh, giving, right? Uh, God has given us so much uh, that it is overflowing, Lord, that you have given us peace. You have given us love, God. You has given us a relationship with your son, Lord, uh, that we believe and trust that it is you who provides everything in our lives, um, that it is not something that we are just super smart and awesome that are able to create, Lord, but you give us resources, Lord, 
that we can also give those resources to help the community, right? To help other people around us, Lord, to be your hands and feet, Lord, and help us be faithful in the little that we have been given so that we can be faithful with more and to further your kingdom, Lord, instead of ours. Um, there's a couple different ways you can uh, give. You can give through the app. Uh, you can give through uh, these awesome envelopes, right? Um, they, you can put these in and there's a little box right there. You know, if you're kind of like vintage or, you know, old school, like that's, yeah, come on. I'm into vintage. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways. We don't discriminate, right? Do your way. Uh, but ever, overall is we want to be the way, we want to give the way the Father has taught us to be a cheerful giver, right? To just worship Father uh, for all that he is doing, for all the blessings that he has done. Um, and so we're just going to pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, God, thank you again for what you are doing in our lives. God, thank you for this journey that you have taken us on, Lord. Uh, I cannot imagine or have imagined thinking that I could be here today, Lord. Thank you for bringing me through this journey and this path, Lord, to uh, fulfilling your will in our lives, Lord. And I pray as we as the church, Lord, would just uh, surrender to you, Lord. We would completely give of ourselves, Lord, our time, our energy, Lord, our finances, everything we have, Lord, that it is yours, Lord. We do this in worship, in gratitude for what you have done, Lord, not out of obligation, Lord, but in gratitude, thanking you, Lord, for your goodness, for your faithfulness and your, your love and joy that you give each and every one of us, Lord. Receive your glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And we're going to worship one more way, and that is in the word. So we're going to read scriptures. Uh, and there's going to be a video about the gospel of Mark. Welcome. I'm thankful for it. Already or no? I'm thankful for my family, my church, my wife, and my brothers here. I'm thankful for my church family. Legos and my family. My family, my job. I'm thankful for my family and what Jesus gave me and for Jesus dying on the cross for me. I'm thankful for my family, my friends, and for all of us to get together on this special day. I'm thankful for Anthem Church. My family. I'm thankful for family, friends, and having shelter. I'm thankful for Jesus and that he's keeping me safe. I'm thankful for food. I'm thankful for, for, for the new country. I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful for my, all my friends here in Anthem. I'm thankful for my for my family and and my friends. My brother and my sister. Good morning, Anthem Church. How are you guys doing? Awesome. I get the high honor today of reading the text before um, Pastor Alex comes out. Um, but before that, I want to introduce myself. My name is Natasha, and honestly, I've been coming to Anthem Church in the very, very beginning, <laughs> early stages, um, and it's truly been the highest honor to see what God has been doing in the church and through the church. Um, so I'm the best news of that is that he's just getting started. He's not done yet. So buckle up, Anthem Church. Um, I serve in the kids' ministry. I serve with the babies and the little toddlers. And it's so much fun to be able to snuggle the little babies and sing, dance, play with the toddlers, and just honestly watch them grow up, proceed to go to the next classes. And it's so much fun. And I also... Um, serve in the ladies' uh, Bible studies that we do. We just finished up First Peter, um, studying First Peter together, and it's so awesome to gather together with ladies and study the truth because it trickles down into every aspect. When we leave our work, our home life, our mothering, our everything. Um, so I encourage you guys, if you're not um, serving anywhere or doing anything, come up to me. I could plug you into nursery or the ladies' Bible studies. 
So I'm going to be reading today from uh, Mark 2, starting uh, verse 23. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abi Ather and the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and also gave some of his gave some to his companions. Then he told them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a shriveled hand. In order to accuse him, they were watching him closely to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. He told the man with the shriveled hand, stand before us. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. After looking around at them with anger, he was grieved at the hardness of their hearts and told the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and his hand was restored. Immediately, the Pharisees went out and started plotting with the Herodians against him how they might kill him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will tell you that the ladies in their Bible studies are putting some pressure on the guys in the room. Uh, from what I understand, the last session we had 40-something ladies come. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, man. I think it's time for us to really step up. Uh, pray that the Lord would send laborers uh, for our brothers. Uh, God has put on my heart starting January to, to start a men's Bible study as well for the guys to go deep into the Word of God. And so, brothers, you ready? Don't, don't fail me now. Don't fail me now. Awesome. If you guys are visiting us for the first time, my name is Pastor Alex. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor of Anthem Church. We have an amazing team of elders, pastors, ministry leaders, uh, deacons, uh, volunteers. In a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating our volunteers. We're having our annual Christmas serve team party, and we're expecting 150 volunteers to show up, and these are the people that make Anthem Church happen. They are the hands and the feet of Jesus here in this local body. And I can't wait. I can't wait. We believe that God has so much more in store for us. And and really, these people are serving selflessly. There is no hidden agenda. There's no, there's no, you know, working up a certain ladder because there is no ladder. The higher you go, the lower you need to humble yourself. Um, the, the more responsibility you have, the more you need to die to yourself. That's the way of the kingdom. And so if you would like to die to yourself, join us at the Christmas party. We are going through uh, the book of Mark. It is one of the synoptic gospels. The four gospels um, are the four accounts of the life of Jesus. And uh, the, the word gospel means good news, right? And so you have four books talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. And um, uh, today we're going to be looking at the specific text, which is good news for us. And what is it? It is Jesus defending the Sabbath. Jesus defending the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a gift, uh, a, a gift of God for man. It's a good thing for men. And let me ask you this. How many of you guys, how many of us actually practice the Sabbath? Like We got two, three people. We have three people that practice the Sabbath. What probably happened is that it has been robbed from us. It has been robbed from us. And today, the goal is to claim it back in Jesus' name. To claim it back in Jesus' name. The word Sabbath is, um, it's not just this Old Testament concept. The word itself means to cease, to stop. The double B in Sabbath is this intensified form of stop, cease, don't, 
Don't continue working. Stop laboring. I mean, stop it right now. Stop. But not in a mean way, not in a terrifying way, not an intimidating way, but in a loving, convincing way. I beg you, please stop as if though you are about to jump off the cliff and die. That's the word Sabbath. We first find this word in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. This is the creation story. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested, or Sabbath, on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Verse 3, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all the, all his work that he had done in creation. So we have this picture of for six days God is creating the universe, right? God is separating darkness from light. God is creating uh, our planet. God is creating the mountains, the waters, the creatures. God is creating the solar system, right? God is creating such details that perhaps we know of and we don't know of. God is creating man. God is creating DNA. God is creating bones, and he's, he's creating the brain. There's so much detail in the six days of creation. God is laboring. He is working. God is getting things done for six days. And on the seventh day, God creates. He creates rest. Many people say God created the seventh day and then he rested, but that's not what is happening. God is creating rest on the seventh day. God is creating rest on the seventh day. Many people only live with six days of working, working, completely living without the context of the seventh day, which is rest, which is Sabbath. God has given us a gift, the seventh day, and that day is to be holy. The word holy for the first time is used in this context. Right? When we think about holiness, what, what, what comes to mind, right? To be different, to be set apart for the Lord, right? Holiness is to be good in a sense, right? Not to be evil, to stay away from sin, right? That's what holy men, uh, holiness means to us. But the context, the first time the word holy is used is in the story of creation addressing the seventh day. The seventh day is different from all six days, there's nothing like the seventh day. The seventh day is a day of rest. Many people in this room need to listen to a sermon on working for six days. If you are uh, prone to resting all the time, and we will describe what kind of resting that is, that is not the godly resting, that is the sinful resting. But the seventh day is to be holy because it is a day of rest. So how is it going for us? Are you feeling rested? Do you feel like you are honoring the seventh day? Is it holy for you? Is it sacred for you? Is it set apart for you? Does it look different than the rest of your six days? The truth is, we're not. I'm not. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not perfectly honoring the day of rest. God has convicted me. This sermon is for me. The sermon is for us. Why is it so hard for us to observe the day of rest? Friends, because we have this gravitational pull to keep going. We have this gravitational pull to keep getting things done. We have a gravitational pull to produce, to execute. We have this gravitational pull to, for more and more and more and more. Just one more step, just one more task, just one more set of laundry just one more meal, just one more uh, uh, repair, just one more. We have this gravitational pull for more. 
We have three enemies to our spirit that are, that are causing us to break the day of rest. Number one, that is your flesh. That is your sinful nature. That is the Adam nature of you, the old man. Number two, it is the culture, the world. It's the culmination of fleshes, putting together a certain ideology, a certain way of living, and that is, uh, uh, that is uh, assassinating God's uh, truth on the day of rest. And then lastly, we have Satan. He will not let us rest. Satan will not let us rest. There's this famous uh, quote that says, if Satan can't get you to sin, he'll get you to be busy. If he can't get you to compromise on certain truths of the word of God, if he can't get you to lie, if he can't get you to be angry, he'll get you to be hurry or get you to be busy. Is that resonating with anyone? I feel like that's one of my greatest sins, just constantly busy. John Mark Homer, he says that hurry is violence on the soul. Hurry is violence on the soul. For seven days, you are producing, performing. This is taking a, soul, a, a toll on your soul. The Israelite, the people of God, right? The Israelites, descendants of Abraham in the Old Testament. There is this picture of them being in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, and they're crying out to God. Why? Because they are slaves to the Egyptian uh, 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 currency, the Egyptian culture. They're slaves to the Egyptian economy, uh, 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 ideology. They're slaves to Egypt. And what is happening is Egypt is causing them to work 24 7. And if you read the context, what is Israel doing? What are they doing? They're building storehouses. There is this city that was designated by Pharaoh, and it was the city of supply, meaning the a city of storage units. Storage units. The city where you uh, store your excess. And they're, and they're causing, he's causing God's people who are to honor and rest on the seventh day to labor 24-7 to fulfill the desire of Pharaoh. They're working, they're laboring, and Pharaoh's saying, more, 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 more work, more task, more buildings, more storehouses, more storages. And this was the language of Pharaoh when uh, God sends Moses to come and deliver the people out of this bondage, to deliver the people out of this way of living, working seven days a week as slaves to the system, to the culture to the masters, God delivers them, and God knows, listen, God knows, listen, you desperately need this freedom, and what happens is Moses comes to Pharaoh, and he says, listen, God says, let my people go. It's time for them to go into the wilderness just for one day and rest in God's sovereignty and worship the Lord. These people need a break with their Savior, with their Lord, their Creator, and you know what the response of Pharaoh was? In Exodus 5, 17, it says, Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. Lazy. That's what devil tells us. That's what our flesh tells us. That's what the culture tells us. When we try to honor the, the Lord's day, the day of rest, he says, you're lazy. Get back to work. Get back to producing. Get back to proving. Get back to hustling. Get back to hurry. Lazy. You're not trying to worship the Lord. You're just lazy, right? That's the pressure we feel from the culture. If you're not hustling, if you're not grinding, you're considered lazy, you don't, you're not dreaming, dreaming big enough. You don't care about retirement. You don't really care about vacations. You're just lazy. That's what you are. 
Right? Think about it. In the morning, you wake up and God is calling you for time of silence and solitude in his presence. Don't work. Don't produce. Just spend time in my presence. And what does the flesh tell you? You are lazy. Get off your knees. You need to get, get to work. You need to, you need to tidy some things up before the kids wake up. And so God rescues them from this culture. Friends, this is our culture. This is our culture. Lazy, lazy is what they're telling the believers if we try to rest on the seventh day. And so God brings them out. And, and listen, God is bringing them out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in them. This, this, this uh, daunting and uh, horrific voice of uh, accusations of being lazy is lingering in people's minds. Lingering. They're out of Egypt, and yet they still hear this, this phrase, you are lazy, get back to work. And so God, he begins to bring back the concept of Sabbath in Exodus chapter 31. He says, verse 12, then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe this, my Sabbath. This will be a sign between me and you for Uh, for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. And listen, anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Those who do not, uh, those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day it is a day of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath is to be put to death. There's repetition in that. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. They are to celebrate it. This is to be good news, the euangelion for God's people. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. He was refreshed Ruach, the wind and breath of God, refreshing man. That is the heart of Sabbath. God says, listen, if you don't stop performing, if you don't stop working, proving to be someone to others, if you, are, if you don't stop pursuing your way to righteousness, listen, what will happen is you will die. You will die. Now, in this context is they were to go and kill that person. Why? Because that person would be yeast. He would spread this theology. He would spread this culture of hustle and grind. And God says, destroy, kill, right? In our context, what that means is confess that sin, right? Get it out. Man, if there's someone amongst you that is not honoring the Sabbath day, man, confront that sin. Report it to the church. This brother, this sister is living in sin. They're missing the mark. They're not seeing the gospel. They're not seeing the euangelion. Let's pray. Let's intercede. Let's try to help this person six days a week so that on the seventh day they could rest. Can you imagine The church would begin to intervene, hold each other accountable. Sister, why are you doing laundry on the day of rest? Do you want us to come and help you on Friday before small group, right? Friends, and and here's what God says in this context. This day of rest is done to the Lord. It's not done to yourself. It's done to, this is how you love God. This is how you honor God is by resting, by being still and knowing that he is God. And this context is when you hold, when you upkeep this covenant, you will know me. You will know me. There will be a one day undivided intimacy, attention, communion with the Father. If you don't rest, you will die and cause others to die. And I'm just, I wanted to repent because I've put that pressure on my family. I put that expectation on my wife, my kids. I put that expectations perhaps even on some of you in leadership. 
And I just want to repent before all of you. I've been in error. I have not been honoring the seventh day. What happens is they get this covenant from Moses, right? They get this instruction from Moses. And years later, years later, the Pharisees, they hijack Sabbath. We're going back to the text. They're hijacking Sabbath. And what's interesting is in this context, right, when God is giving instructions for the Sabbath, there is no details of how you should have that day look like. All it says is don't work, don't perform, right? Rest, whatever that looks like. Maybe, maybe it's going on a hike. Maybe it's sleeping in. Maybe it's, we'll, we'll kind of get to some of the practicals, but there's no details of what that looks like. Just stop working. That's all God's saying. Stop working. But the Pharisees, they began to define what that rest should look like. They began to dictate they, they took on this responsibility of being interpreters of the, the, the concept of Sabbath. And what we have in the context of Jesus is the, uh, the Jewish community had the Talmud. The Talmud was the central text of the rabbinic uh, Judaism and the primary source of Jewish religious law and Jewish theology. It was this book on uh, Jewish practice, Jewish covenants. It was the how-to booklet. And it wasn't small. It had 517 chapters. 24 chapters alone were on the day of Sabbath, dedicated for Sabbath. And let me just read uh, some of these uh, instructions that they gave the Jewish people. Uh, Before uh, one rabbi said he spent two and a half years studying one chapter to figure out all the fine print. Spent two years trying to figure out one chapter. He had 24 to go. Here's what we see. No burden could be carried that that weighed more than a, a dried fig tree or half a fig carried two times. If you put an olive in your mouth and rejected it because it was bad, you couldn't put a whole one in the next time because the palate had tasted the flavor of a whole olive. If you threw an object in the air and caught it with, an, uh, with the other uh, hand, it was a sin. If you caught it in the same hand, it wasn't a sin. A tailor couldn't carry a needle. The scribe couldn't carry his pen. A student couldn't carry his books. No fire could be lit. Cold water could not be poured on, uh, cold water could be poured on warm water, but warm water could not be poured on cold water. Man, that just sounds like torture. An egg could not be boiled even, even, if it, uh, even if all you did was put it in the sand. You could not bathe for fear when the water fell off of you, it might wash the floor. Some of our spouses are probably, some of the wives are hoping, man, I, I wish that was true when our husband's taking a bath. If a candle was lit, you couldn't put it out. If it wasn't lit, you couldn't light it up. Women couldn't look in a glass or they might find a white hair and be tempted to pull it out. Women women couldn't wear jewelry because jewelry weighs more than a dried fig. Not our jewelry. It goes on and on. Laws uh, Laws about honey, milk, spitting, writing, getting dirt off your clothes. You couldn't travel more than 3,000 feet. Some say you can't go more than 90, 1,999 steps. If you take the 2,000 step, you violated the Sabbath. Now, this would be uh, from Friday when the sun goes down till Saturday when it goes up. The only way you can go further than just uh, then it is, um, the only way you can go further is by putting food uh, at the 1,999 uh, mile marker on Friday before Sabbath. And once you get to the food, you get another 1,999 steps to go either forward or back home. So you have to be strategic. Let's place the food here. I mean, where do you find this in the Exodus? This is the background to the Jews harassing Jesus. And listen, let's go back to the text. On Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? These guys are, they're, they're traveling. 
They're going through grains of field. This was the way you would travel. There wasn't roads uh, the way we have roads through every single gridded blocks. They didn't have all that. If you wanted to uh, cut, cut, uh, find a shortcut to a city, you would go through the grain field. That was permissible. And these guys are hungry on the Sabbath. They're traveling. Man, these guys are starving. And all they're doing is just, they're just reaching out and grabbing heads of grain. And they're rolling it up and they're eating it. And what's interesting is the Sabbath, they are, uh, the Pharisees are following these guys around. Are they counting their steps? That's the question. They're too busy following these guys. They're, they're not watching how they're breaking the Sabbath. Right? Jesus is not doing anything unlawful. If you actually look at Exodus, there was God made provision for travelers that were traveling through someone's grain field and that were hungry. They were allowed to to take heads of grain, but they were not allowed to take a sickle and start harvesting. That would be considered theft. And so Jesus is within the boundaries of the Torah. The Torah was always meant to give life and not death. And yet these guys, the way they are interpreting is they see it as breaking the law. They're saying, listen, you should die. Because Exodus says, if anyone breaks the law, you should die. How does Jesus respond to their actions? He says, and he said to them, have you never read? Right? Have you never read? Saying that to the Pharisees, have you guys never read your Bibles? If you never read the Torah, I mean, this literally, it's all they're doing. They're reading full time the Torah. They're interpreting the Torah. That's what they get paid for. Have you never read? He says, What did David do when he was hungry? What did David do when he was, when he was being persecuted by Saul, being a future anointed king, per- pursuing threats and or, uh, fleeing threats of Saul? What did he do? He walks into, he said in verse 26, he entered the house of God in the time of uh, Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. What happened? The bread of presence was was there for, uh, it was was to honor God. It was this this, uh, ritual where you would worship God by putting this bread before the altar, the holy of holies. And when it, would, when it would get cold, they would take it, replace it with warm bread, and they would take that bread and give it to the priest, and the priest would eat. That was their ritual. That was their tradition. But when David came in with, with uh, robbers and murderers and, and, and uh, 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 just criminals, and they were hungry, the priest broke the ritual and gave food to David. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, listen, if you read the Torah, you understand that it's, it's man's life is always more valuable than rituals. Man's life is always more valuable than, than any man-made rules and traditions. It's all about the man, right? We have our, one of our community standards is everyone is in a life group, if you didn't know. We, that's the way we pastor, but we will not kill you if you don't attend life group. Life group was meant to give you life. It was meant to liberate you. It was meant to help you be sanctified more into the image of God. But can you imagine if we were so obsessed about everyone joining a life group that we started to give people warnings on the third warning where you're, you're done. You're out of here. Like we're giving you up to Satan, right? Imagine that. Some guys were thinking about that. I said, guys, we can't. I'm (laughs) joking. And so what Jesus is saying, listen, all these rituals, they pale in comparisons to life. All of this is for life. The other example that we see is uh, uh, Jesus is in the temple, and there is this man with the withered hand, and Jesus wants to Jesus is, wants to do what only Jesus can do, right? Give life. That's what the Sabbath is about, is life, restoration, healing, nourishment. That's what the Sabbath is about. And the Bible says that these Pharisees are lurking. What's Jesus going to do? I see a sick man there. I see a sick man. I see a weary brother there. I see a weary brother there. What is he going to do? Jesus comes and he heals this man. 
And listen what they say. And he said to them, it is lawful. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved, in his, uh, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians about how to destroy him. What's happening These guys are so obsessed about Jesus giving life on the day of Sabbath that they're willing to go and partner with the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? These guys are traitors. These guys are Jewish people that have have allegiance towards Herod. Herod is a, a, a tyrant in the region. Herod is an awful man. But listen, only Herod has the right and the authority to kill Jesus. So they're creating alliances to kill Jesus. Friends, what's happening? What's happening? They're against life, but they're willing to plot to kill Jesus on Sabbath. What happened? The day of life became the the day of death. The easiest day of the week became the hardest day of the week. What happened? Man took over the Sabbath. Man became the author of Sabbath. The reason why perhaps you are dead today, you're exhausted, you're weary, is because you are the author of Sabbath. You are defining what your life looks like. You are defining what the seventh day looks like for you. And how are you doing? Better hurry up because I got a few more points. What's the modern day slavery? What is happening to the Mer- America now? We're busy, we're working, we're hustling. How? Where did this come from? After World War I, after uh, warehouses were empty, workers were, were without work, there was a, a, a banking firm that had this clever idea. Listen, we have, we have people sitting around. We have empty warehouses. We need to do something about it. And so Paul Mazur, who was the leading investor banker at the firm of Lee, Lehman Brothers in New York, he actually wrote a book in 1928 titled American Prosperity. Listen to what his strategy was. He says, we must shift America from a needs to a desire culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Man's desire must overshadow his needs. All the advertisements that you see are presenting this idea of rest if you buy this. If you go on vacation, if you upgrade your new house with that perfect backyard, then you will rest. If you buy this for your kids to distract them, then you will rest. Right? Advertisement. And what, what, what are they, do they care about? No, they don't care about us. That's the culture. That's Egypt. Think about back Black Friday. Did you know that in 1993, the uh, economists predicted Americans working uh, 15 to, uh, Amer- the economists predicted by, that by the 2000s, in 1993, by the, by the 2000s, that America would be working 50 to 20 hours a week. We would be working 50 to 20 hours a week. Why? Because of the uh, technology advancement. If we produce more robots, if we produce more technology, the iPhone, if we, we will just make it easier for people to work less. Did you know what happened? America actually now works 47 to 60 hours a week. We are the hardest working uh, nation in, uh, in, in the world. On average, Americans work 137 hours more, uh, more than every other, or, sorry, more hours every year than Jap- Japanese workers who were perceived as chronically overworked. 260 more hours than the British workers, 394 hours more than the average uber-efficient German worker, and a whole 499 more hours uh, per year than the workers in France. That's why we want to go to France. (laughs) Karl Rayner, a German theologian, this is what he wrote. He said, 
in the torment of insufficiency of everything attainable, we come to understand that here in this life, all uh, symphonies remain unfinished. What is he saying? He says, look, this desire for more, this desire, this idea that if you get this, if you buy this, you will find rest for your soul. He says, no, 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 you will not. It's like an unfinished symphony. It's, it's like watching, the, uh, watching Gladiator and on the best part of the movie, the, the TV shuts off, right? It's, it's your favorite song. It's that one bridge that's about to come off, man, and you turn up your volume. You're like, all right, come at me. Let's go. You're getting your voice ready, and then the radio breaks. And it's over and 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 over again. You're constantly disappointed and you're never at rest. Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the author of Sabbath. Not these Pharisees, not you, not your pastor not your pastors and elders, not your life group leader. Jesus Christ is the creator of rest. Matthew 11, 28. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Jesus is the author of rest. If you truly want to find rest for your soul, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He will heal you. Come to Jesus. I know I'm a little behind schedule here, but I just, I really want to read this passage and just share a thought and we'll pray. Hebrews chapter four, verse one. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, good news, still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. There's a promise. There's an opportunity for you to enter his rest. Mom, mom, dad, ministry leader, pastor, elder, grandma, grandpa, there's a promise, but make sure you don't fall short of entering his rest. For we also have had good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. They didn't believe in the Sabbath. They said it was the Old Testament. They said it's not for us. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said so I declare an oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest and yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words where did he write it? I think in Genesis on the seventh day God rested from all his work and again in the passage above uh, he says they shall never enter my rest Therefore, since it, is st- since it still remains for some to enter the rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day calling it today. This, he said, when a long time after he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart the way Pharaoh hardened his heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Listen, this is really important. They were observing the day of Sabbath. Joshua was giving them a day of Sabbath, but Joshua would not say that, hey, there's a better day coming. There's a better Sabbath coming. There's a a day that's coming that's not just the day off. Because many people have a day off. And God's saying there's more than just a day off. There's more than just a day off not to go to work and do catch up on chores, do your laundry and and run some errands. No, no, that's not the rest that Jesus is talking about. That's not the seventh day. 
There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest and also rests from their works, just as God from His, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the examples of disobedience. Friends, Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus is inviting us to a relationship with Him. Jesus rested on the Sabbath when He was crucified. He died. On Saturday, He was buried. And on Sunday, He resurrected so that we would have life. Jesus rested so that we would rest. He's inviting us into this relationship where on the Sabbath day, this is what we do. We rest in His grace and mercy. We do, we, we do examination of what God has done for us and who He is, uh, who we are in Christ. We are, we, are, we are satisfied. We are fulfilled through this one day of resting, not just from physical labor, but from spiritual labor, where we're working out our own salvation. Right? We're just resting in God's sovereignty. What happens is after that, we're able to work out of a healthy posture able to work out of a healthy posture. And so practically, what would it look like for us to rest? What would it look like? Number one, find a day. Find a day. Maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday is your day of rest. Dedicate this to the Lord. Right? Don't run errands. Just enjoy this day. Go on a walk with your kids. Sleep in. Take a nap. Grill a good steak. Watch a movie but do it all for the glory of Jesus. The ra- a, a one rabbi once says, if you work with your mind, you should Sabbath with your hands. If you work with your hands, you should Sabbath with your mind. As a pastor, I work with my mind all the time. And so for me, on my day off, I just want to build something. I just want to do some kind of hobby that with my hands because that's how I rest. And if you're always working with your hands, man, take a day where you just, you're, 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 you're resting with your mind, right? Or whatever, you got to get it. The filter that you want to use is, this is John Mark Homer's filter, is, is it rest and is it worship? Am I resting and am I worshiping Jesus? And there's this famous saying, and I'm going to close with this, Israel didn't keep the Sabbath. Sabbath kept Israel. Jesus keeps us. We don't keep Jesus. Jesus keeps us. But we need to be obedient and humble ourselves and rest in Jesus. Amen? You guys want to stand on your feet. Father, we thank you for today. I want to just say sorry for going late, Jesus. Lord, we repent. We repent, Father, for not trusting you, for not being still and knowing that you are God, for not emulating you, for not being true image bearers, because on the seventh day you rested, and God, oftentimes we refuse to. We we violate the, the seventh day. We violate the day of rest. Father, forgive us. Lord, I pray that there's that, that we would all hear this message today. And this would set us free, God. This would save us, Lord. All the weary souls in the room. That we we would be liberated from the American dream. We would be liberated from consumerism. We would be liberated from these false advertisements about rest. And we would allow you to dictate and interpret what true Sabbathing looks like, Lord. there's anyone that's weary today, your soul, your body, your mind, emotions, you're just tired. Our choir is going to sing right now, and I just want to invite you guys to come and be refreshed at the altar. Find someone and just ask them to pray for you. I just pray that God does something today in this room in the next two minutes.
friends, uh, I want to just encourage you, if you have time this week, uh, maybe, maybe don't watch, uh, you know, Netflix or whatever, Squid Games. I, what I want to encourage you guys to do is um, read your Bibles, spend some time in prayer, figure out what, what day would that look like. Talk to your spouse. If you're married, what, what, day, what day would that be for us to practice Sabbath, right? And for more clarity, if you go to uh, practicingtheway.org, there is eight sermons on Sabbath. Sabbath as a rhythm of life, Sabbath as resistance against culture, and so on. Amazing. And they give you practicals of how it would look like to practice Sabbath. Do it. Practicingtheway.org. That's practicing the way of Jesus, of course, .org. Friends, God bless you. Go and rest. Enjoy this day. Delight in the Lord.